All right, I start this off now. I want everybody to remember, put your seven-year-old hat on and your nine-year-old hat because I brought this, I did this for trying to teach the youngsters thing. So the fact that adults are coming now is just an added bonus. <clears throat> Eve is the mother of humanity, and I think most of us who have read some and, and researched a little bit know that somewhere around 200,000 years ago, according to the anthropologists and the geneticists and everywhere else, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, which is our species, started in East Africa. And the interesting thing for the youngsters is that I let them know that 130,000 years of that 200,000 years went by before anybody left the African continent. So the diversity that you see on the African continent has something to do with the fact that for 130,000 years no one ever left Africa, which makes the rest of the world unpopulated until they started trickling out some 70,000 years ago. And 70,000 years ago, of course, then populated the rest of the world. So you see places like Andaman Islands, which is down, you know, close to, uh, you know, southern India going across to those uh, smaller Asian countries. The people still there look just like they're right here from Ghana or from Africa. Uh, of course, we have the Australians who are about 60,000 years old, so, you know, you can still see those similarities. The people who stayed south look more like us. The people who started going north because of the sun, because of the melanin, because of all of those things, they began to change complexions until they became Europeans, Chinese, and the rest. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll keep going. But it, I like to use the word Eve because the children here have all seen Adam and Eve. Everybody has Adam and Eve. Europeans have blanketed for a for hundred years, you know, this place with pictures and literatures of this European Eve. No one's explained how we could ever come out of us, but the geneticists can show how they can come, I mean, how we can come out of them, but the geneticists show easily how they can come out of us. So we want that to be clear. Tenua Chebi, one of the great writers, uh, Things Fall Apart is probably what he's best known for. Uh, he was an Igbo man uh, out of Nigeria. I worked for the uh, Nigerian Broadcasting Company, did a lot of things. Some of the other works, Ant Hills of the Savannah, uh, Man and the People, all of these. But the main reason he's here is because the clarity of his writing and also giving us a lot of insight into how we were living prior to them coming, when they came, and some of our behaviors after they quote unquote left during the colonial time. Asa Hilliard, who knows Asa Hilliard? Asa Hilliard was one of those African men who taught us a whole lot coming up. He's an Egyptologist, he's a historian, psychologist by training, and just all around uh, giving and brilliant brother. He was also in school here in Ghana, too, as, as a chief down in the central region. Uh, Yaa Santua, you hear a lot more about her. She's the queen mother of Ajisu, up in the Ashanti area. Um, she's the one that basically led the struggle against the British during her time. Uh, hopefully, if you go to... Are you guys going to Kumasi? Yes. When you go to Kumasi, you'll hear a whole lot more about her um, being the Ashanti queen. And have them... Uh, read her quote that she was imploring her men to fight. It's very, very uh, interesting. Uh, dead on Kimathi, Kimathi. How many of y'all heard of Mau Mau? Yeah. Okay, that was the British calling uh, our, they were really the Kikuyu, the Kenyan land freedom army, because what happened, of course, when the British came, they were taking all of the best land, the high land and everything. And since they had a uh, jump on the weaponry, we had to go into guerrilla warfare mode uh, led mainly by Dedan Kamathi and uh, his freedom Ar land freedom army. They finally uh, captured him. This picture, the, the drawing was of a picture right after they captured him. And I always like this drawing because of defiant look. Because if you can see the whole thing, he's chained and roped and on the ground and down. But he still looks like, hey, y'all make the mistake of letting one of these cuffs fall off. It's going to be on again, you know. So that's dead on Kamathi. People who know uh, Jerry Rawlings, who just passed here in Ghana, uh, his son is named Kamathi, and he named him for this person. So a lot of the Ghanaians don't know Kamathi, but they know Rawlings' son is Kamathi, and he was named for this person. So they're always like, wow, okay, this is, you know. So that gives it a little context. It gives you an idea where Jerry's head was at that time. And Zynga of Angola, you probably hear some people with names in Zynga. She was fighting against the Portuguese. She basically fought almost her whole life trying to maintain the sovereignty of her people in today what is Northern Angola. Um, there's a lot of stories around about how she personally dealt 
with the uh, Portuguese uh, kings and royalty and all of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, they ended up winning, but she fought him for a lifetime. Ajete, Sergeant Ajete, you want to do Ajete? My son who just uh, went to the barber without me, and I went to the barber without him, so he's been teasing me about my hair. I haven't been teasing him about it. I just said, we need a race ahead every now and then. He's going to tell us about Sergeant Ajete, right? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Sergeant Colino Sajeti. I was born in Labadi, here in Ghana, and educated at Osu. When I, when I grew to a young man, I joined the Royal West African Frontier Force. The Frontier Force had African soldiers from Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Gambia. In World War I, I fought against the Germans who had come to East Africa. In World War II, I and many other African soldiers fought against the Japanese to force them out of India and Burma. The Japanese fought hard. They killed many, many African soldiers were killed. And, but we also killed many Af Japanese soldiers. We were able to push them out of India and Burma. Today, we have a camp, we have a military base in Ghana called Burma Camp. We helped the Americans, the British, and the French win that war. But after the war, we suffered death, injury, and disease. But after the war, the British who had colonized us refused to honor their promise to give us our pensions. Mm. We Africans didn't get anything for our fighting. Mm -hmm. We should have known to never trust the Europeans, mm -hmm. since they had ever brought us for slavery and colonialism. Mm. So. We began to protest against the British. I and I, I and some other people marched to the castle where I heard gunshots. I'm sorry to say, but that's all I can remember. This is the day I was killed and mm -hmm. became an ancestor. Mm -hmm. Two more African soldiers were killed with me by a British major named Emily. More than 60 other Africans were injured. The people of Accra were very angry. They began to riot. The riots grew bigger and bigger, and the British called an emergency. They started jailing and arresting people everywhere. They started jailing and arresting people everywhere. Kwame Nkrumah and the other five major leaders were also jailed. Today, we know them as the big six. The people of Ghana were so angry, they forced for them to be released. The British wanted to rule, the British wanted to rule over Ghana, over the Ghanaians, but the Ghanaians wanted self-government now. The British, finally the rule by the British came to an end here in Ghana. I hope my people see what I died for was the liberation and freedom of African people. I'm proud to have given my life for the African people here in Ghana. I hope my family and friends see what I died for was the liberation and dignity of African people. I am Sergeant Sajeti. I am a soldier, an African soldier. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. Beautiful. Uh, they, they know several of these, but you know, it takes time. So I'm going to start putting them on YouTube so people can... Uh, yes. Yeah. Show their children. Yes, yes. Yes. You know, so every week I'm going to have a different one on. We have a bunch of them they've already done. And uh, so the, the children from other places, from Brazil, America, yes. wherever yeah. it is, parents can say, look, you know, learn these people. And yeah. also give them some encouragement to, you know, they can do it, they can do it, right? YouTube okay, has really so changed the game. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. This is the whole thing is the, is the youth. I mean, it's not yes. the whole thing, but it's most of it. Yes. Uh, because future. we talk about all this African stuff we're going to do. Well, who's going to do it? The future. There's Me and you. Exactly. I mean, we're going to, you know, hopefully we can future. get us kicked yeah. off. Mm -hmm. But the people who have to carry it out are them. Yes. If they don't have the right orientation, then the game is over. Uh, Maurice Bishop, uh, some of y'all might remember in 1983, the... Americans had bombed Grenada, supposedly because they were putting in some long runways for Soviet planes. It was all nonsense. The reason they bombed Grenada and the reason they uh, uh, 
uh, Maurice Bishop was killed because they had something called the New Jewel Movement. Mm -hmm. I think Jewel stood for something like justice, education, um, I forget everything, but liberation, all of that. But anyway, they had really changed uh, the living standards of the people in Grenada. The education had gone up to almost, the literacy had gone up to almost 100%. I mean, uh, they, they reduced all of these imports of food and all these kind of things. So he was really making a, a lot of progress. So he was really taken out of there and the revolution killed because uh, they basically didn't want a black man, a black Castro, I think is what they're really afraid of, who was showing that this kind of autonomy. 100,000 people is, is all is in the nation, so they couldn't have yeah. been a threat to America. That was Reagan and they even that practiced, did that. huh? That was Reagan that did that. That was Ronald Reagan, Ronald 1983. Reagan, yeah. And they even practiced, you know, if you can, if you look around, you'll see him talking mm -hmm. about the Americans practicing their invasion of Grenada. And I think they used Vieques up in Puerto Rico. And so this is a game, and there's nothing other than trying to kill a, the threat of a good example. So they have to go here, Namatong, or they call them the Amazon warriors. These are the sisters in Dahomey, which is also Benin today. And uh, they were kind of the, the point of the spear as they began, as they fought against the French. They were highly trained, highly disciplined. They had some motto, which is like, uh, either we go and we're victorious or we don't come back. You know, there's something to that effect. We win or we don't come back. Yeah, all of these, these sisters are really tough. And so, um, if you really want to read about it, just you have to read what the French had to say about them. Even in their disparaging remarks, you can see they had full respect for the system. Edward Wilmot Blyden, I think we can call him one of the fathers of Pan-Africanism. Boy, y'all y'all sweating up now. One of the fathers of Pan-Africanism, uh, born in, in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. He's probably most famous for his uh, 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 Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race, Africa for the Africans. Long before Garvey, he had this orientation. We're going to have to build Africa if we're going to have anything. Of course, in Liberia, he became a... Well, actually, well, we'll just keep going. But in Liberia, he became... Um, ran for president. He was the head of a college. He was a well-known diplomat. And even today, the Blyden family is held in high esteem in Liberia. Steve Biko, this is usually the first time I can tell the youngsters about apartheid and what it is because if I ask the youngsters, has anyone heard of apartheid, usually I don't get one single hand <laughs> and maybe even one of the teachers might know. So this is how far we are right here on, in Africa and apartheid wasn't a thousand years ago and we don't even know about that here. So I have to explain them about apartheid and then of course Stephen Biko and uh, the, the uh, Black Consciousness Movement. South African uh, student organizations and all the rest of the things that he did. I write what I like is, is a collection of his writings, so if you ever want to see what was on Steve Biko's mind and why they had to murder him, uh, you read that book and you can kind of see the consciousness that he was building into the population and why they had to snuff that out. Sony Ali, um, Sony, <laughs> Sony Ali, uh, you know, we had the great West African empires, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, uh, Songhai being the biggest one and the last one. Well, he was the founder of the, the Songhai Empire. They, they had all of these provinces that he had d divided the place up into, highly organized. He had an army and also a navy on the Niger River, which was, I think, four to six hundred ships. I mean, the, 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 if you go and try to read about him, you'll see that the Arabs really, who, who documented some of these things, don't really like him because in terms of Islam, he was, you know, he was a Muslim by name, but he was really into his own African spiritual religion. And so they've never trusted him and they never like him because they don't feel like he threw away his traditional African religion for Islam. And so, and he didn't. That might be why he was able to do what he did. Uh, Bahanzan of Dahomey. The homie again is Benin. He was the one I was just mentioning, the, the sisters there, the warriors, were in support of him. They call him the great shark. You know, you always see him with this, this long pipe. And um, he's a phone. You know, and the interesting thing about the phone people, F-O-N, is they really, uh, that's kind of one of the heart uh, lands of what they call Voudon. So you'll see when, even when we start talking about the Haitian Revolution, we're talking about 
predominantly Fon people coming together with their Voudon in hand or in mind or in heart, uh, raising up against Napoleon's army and of course the French, Re the Haitian Revolution. So they come from that, they come from that stock. Mary Makiba, you wanna do Mary Makiba? I don't know, see, okay. You wanna do it? I don't, okay, all right, I'll let her do Mary Makiba. She, um, I don't know if she remembers all of these, but we'll see, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Miriam Makiba, but you can just call me Mama Africa. Many people know me for my music, but there's much, much more. I was born in 1932 in Johannesburg, South Africa. Johannesburg is an European name for an area where we Africans lived long before the Europeans arrived. My mother was put in prison when I was only two weeks old because she was trying to find money by making and selling drinks made out of corn and malt. So I spent the first six months of my life in jail as a baby. My mother was known was an expert in local medicine and was known as a healer. My father died when I was only six, so we were poor. Life was very hard for blacks in South Africa because of a terrible system called apartheid. Apartheid meant we, the blacks, native to this land, were forced by the Europeans to only live on certain, to only go to certain places, to only go, to only travel to certain schools. To only, to only travel on certain roads, to only go to certain schools, and even to only use certain toilets. This in our own country. We weren't even allowed to go to the cities unless the white gave us a paper saying it was okay to be there. I hated apartheid and dreamt of the day it would be over. As I got older, I felt, as I, when I started singing, I felt free. As I got older, my songs became more popular. I even sang in plays and movies. But the white South African government didn't like some of my singers because it showed how much I hated apartheid. When I left the country to perform, I didn't want to come back home. And the white South African government told me that I couldn't come back even if I wanted to. So I went around the world singing in my African style, America, Europe, Asia, and other African countries too. But never in my home, South Africa. In my songs, I always let my fans around the world know about the terrible system of apartheid. I won the Grammy Award for Music. The Peace, I won the Grammy Award for Music, the Peace Award from the United Nations, and a lot of others. But for 31 years, I was not allowed to go back home. Then, in 1990, Nelson Mandela was freed from prison, and he asked me to come back home. It was wonderful coming home. I was so happy I made an album called Homecoming. When I used my, I was so happy I made an album called Homecoming. I used my fame to help those in, girls who were abused, people with drug and alcohol problems, people who had HIV or AIDS, or AIDS. And I always felt that music should be used to tell the truth and help those in need. And this is what I try to do in my life. I think that is why they call me Mama Africa. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. You see what they remember I was